I'd like to welcome Jennifer Moore to the Life Magnetics podcast. Jennifer is a mentor and teacher for sensitive, intuitive women who need help controlling the empathic overwhelm that keeps them stuck in life and in business. Oh, we need to talk to you. So we're so happy you're here today. Um, Jennifer is also the author of the Amazon bestseller, Empathic Mastery, a five-step system to go from emotional hot mess to thriving success. I love alliteration, so that's fantastic. I'm Mm -hmm. already so intrigued. You are also an EFT master trainer, and that's the tapping, right? EFT tapping. exactly. You are the host of the Empathic Mastery Show, and if that weren't fascinating enough, you are also the founder of the Empathic Mastery Academy and creator of three oracle decks. i got to talk to you about that, too, because I want to create one, um, including the Healing Tarot, the Empathic Mastery Oracle, and the Sacred Empath Deck. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. I'm so happy to have you. I love to meet spiritual people. I like to meet weird people like me. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Right there with you. Thank you so much, Crystal Ann, for having me today. I'm just delighted to be here. You're welcome. I have so many things I want to ask you, but typically I like to start at the beginning of a person's life, like take it all the way back. And it's interesting to me though, because um, I was reading about you and apparently you had your first prophetic vision at the Mm -hmm. age of nine years old. And I'd love for you to speak to that. Like, what was that about? Did it come true? And like, tell us what it was like being an intuitive kid. Oh, so it didn't just come true. I actually dreamed of it while it was, while it was going on. And so, um, Basically, when I was nine years old, I had this really vivid dream one night that my mom died and fell over a banister, like she fell over a banister on the stairs, and she just like fell to her death and died. And needless to say, I was nine years old, I woke up in an absolute state of despair. And the whole day was just absolutely awful. And at the end of the day, I, um, my mom, we were at dinner, and my mom said, so-and-so's mom died of breast cancer last night. And I knew because the person who, the person whose mother had died of breast cancer had been my very first BFF. Like I was three when I met her and we were like really, really good friends. And then she moved away. Like they left the state we lived in because we were living in Massachusetts and um, they had moved to New York. So I hadn't seen her for a couple of years at that point in time, but I had this vivid, vivid dream about my mom dying. And then like, and, and then like within le- like 12 hours learning about the death of this other, this friend's mother. And I knew, I just knew from the moment I heard that, that my dream was directly connected to that experience. And that there was just like no ignoring it or denying it. But something I just really recently grasped at a deeper level was that the thing in my experience, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in that I'm going to define the word empath for you, because it feels to me like, you know, we, it's such a buzzword these days. And there are so many people who are using this word that it's kind of like, well, what do you even mean by it? Because it's kind of become just like, I don't know, just like, it's very common, like empath is the new black. And so I just want to be clear when I'm talking about an empath, I'm talking about a human being, a person who is picking up on the thoughts. And actually you could have a dog that's an empath too, or a cat or anybody, but a living being who is picking up the thoughts, the feelings, the energy, the sensations, and um, just all of the stuff that is coming from the world around them. But instead of picking it up in the way that an intuitive or a psychic or a medium or a channel might pick things up where they receive information, but they know they're receiving information that's coming from the outside. The thing about that, that makes an empath really unique is that empaths experience the things that are about other people and about, you know, the earth, the planet, you know, just animals, you name it, but through the lens of our own experience. So like, instead of it being that I'm sort of knowing something about you, I'm thinking about whatever, if you're worrying about something, I start worrying about it. If you are feeling physical pain in your body, I feel the physical pain. If, if you're feeling an emotion, I feel that emotion. And so it was so fascinating to me. And I only really got it recently was that 
I didn't dream about my friend's mother dying. I dreamed about my mom dying. And so I had this experience of prophecy, this experience of like a predict piece of information that was absolutely true that was happening. But as an empath, I experienced it through my filter and I process, process, processed it as if it was my own. So that was something I just recently was like, oh yeah, even that very first experience, I experienced it as an empath, not just as a psychic. Hmm. So interesting. So yeah, yeah. In, in my work and in my life as an intuitive person as well, I've noticed like a correlation between clairsentience, which is the psychic ability to feel and typically within your body and in your emotionality and empathy, which seems to be kind of a more, I don't know, I'd like you to define maybe the delineation between the two. Yeah, yeah. well, and so there's, I mean, there's clairsentience, which is that sort of like, you you know, the knowing and the feeling. But in my experience, the thing about, and then there's empathy, which is the capacity to imagine ourselves in somebody else's shoes. Whereas in my experience, it's sort of a continuum in the sense that you've got sort of on one side of the spectrum, you've got sort of your like border, you know, you've got your complete, like totally like disconnected narcissists and psychopaths and, you know, sociopaths who don't give, don't care about anybody else. And then you've got what I call the extreme empaths who are on the other side of the spectrum who are so open and porous and so sensitive to picking up the thoughts, the feelings, the energy, the sensations from the world around them, that they could be picking up information coming from the past, from the present, from the future, from not just the immediate vicinity or the people that they know, but could be picking it up from the entire planet or even sometimes like intergalactic stuff. And the thing about, and, and people who are in this role, often they cannot tell what end is up. They cannot distinguish between themselves and another. And so what I find is that there's sort of this, you know, like I would say in terms of a continuum, you've got empath, empathic, empathy, and, you know, sort of clairsentience kind of fits into the, I would say, empathic, empathy, and, you know, empathic and empathy. And, empathy. and then you have sort of like compassion and and sympathy, which definitely has sort of more of a sort of like, I am definitely not going through that experience and I can't even necessarily relate to it, but I can at least have sympathy for somebody going through it. So I would say it's like, we've got, you know, empath, empathic, empathy, um, and sort of the clairsentient kind of fits in all, you know, those, those mm -hmm. categories. And then we've got, as I would say, you know, sort of sympathy, or compassion, and then sympathy. And then you've got the people who start to really not care, um, going down that sort of that thing. But what I've noticed is that the difference between being an empath and having empathy is that where an empath, the irony is that a lot of times when we are drowning in the emotional soup, and we are so overwhelmed by all the feelings that we're picking up, we cannot distinguish, but we also can't like regulate, we can't calm our nervous system down. And so a lot of times we'll just be kind of like floundering. It's very hard to have empathy in that kind of a state because we're often extremely kind of just so disoriented that we're just kind of like in a state of distress thinking about how distressed we are. And so ironically, a lot of times I think that empaths sometimes actually need to cultivate empathy because the thing about empathy is that empathy is not that absorbent, um, uh, enmeshed experience that being an empath is. Empathy is, there's a sense, there is an understanding of the separation between the self and other. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, a little while, right when the war in Ukraine broke out, there was all those pictures on social media of people fleeing Ukraine with their pets, you know, their dog on a leash, their cats and cat carriers, they're on foot, they're leaving their cities, they're leaving everything behind and they're going through it. 
And I was going through a period like very, when it sort of first erupted, often I find that I'll have a period where when something really intense kind of like erupts on the planet, if it's sort of a new level of intensity, I'll kind of go through sort of like I'll wobble a little bit for a day or two or sometimes a week or two. And so I was kind of wobbling. And as I was watching these, these, this footage and seeing the pictures on social media, all of a sudden I'm seeing myself with my dog and my cats walking down my, my road with my little wheelie suitcase and imagining that I'm leaving behind everything. And I'm experiencing it as if it is mine. I'm experiencing all of this as if it's mine. And I really had to sort of dial out and pull back and kind of go, this is not your experience and you are not there. And in, if anything, it's actually kind of self-centered or selfish, selfish isn't quite the right word, but self-centered or self-absorbed to imagine that you're going through the same level of distress that these people are. Because the truth is I am safe in the United States in a very stable part of the, you know, very, a nice stable, you know, environmentally stable part of the United States here in the Northeast in Maine. I am, you know, settled. I've got a home. I've got a roof over my head. I've got food in my belly. I'm in a relationship that's nice and stable. My pets are healthy. All is well in my world. And to imagine, to go into, to spiral out into distress about an imagined loss of my, of my home and my, and, and fleeing is actually really inaccurate. But it's also really not doing a service to the people who are going through that experience. And so what I realized was that I really needed to kind of back the truck up, kind of meh, 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 get out of there and instead just really work on cultivating empathy for the fact that there are people going through this, but at the same time, also cultivating gratitude for the fact that I am safe, that I am I am nourished, that I have resources and that all, that all is well in my world. So, so that the stimuli that you're receiving, first of all, it sounds like you have to develop or cultivate kind of a, certainly a discipline, maybe even a hypervigilance to always be checking in to see what does this belong to me or does it not? But is when empathic information comes in, is it like a prompt for you to kind of click into a state of service? Like, oh, I'm, I'm receiving this feeling about Ukraine. And so now let's get to praying for Ukraine or let's get into gratitude. It's, is it a prompt usually for you to do something as opposed to just feel something? Um, it, it, I would say that for me, it became, I cultivated it as a prompt to take action. But for the first like three decades of my life, I, I, it was much more of a kind of topsy turvy sort of, you know, storm, perfect storm of just like not really knowing what to do. And it was only as I really started to understand the magnitude of what it means to be picking up the thoughts, the feelings, the energy, the sensations from the world around me and how debilitating and paralyzing it can be when you don't know it's your own, that I started to do that work. And so for me, um, you know, there's a saying in 12 step programs about how you first you come, then you come to, then you come to believe. And I've really been seeing how this journey fits into the idea of empathic mastery, which is what I wrote the book about, because the five steps of empathic mastery are recognize, release, protect, connect, and act. And recognize has sort of three aspects to it. The first step is just recognizing that we're wonky, that we are out of sorts, that we're picking something up. The second part of recognize is starting to ask ourselves, is this mine? Is this mine? And then the third part is what's mine? What's not mine? And so for me, the journey started with even being able to start identifying when I was feeling something and if it was mine and if it was not mine. And so I spent a good period of time cultivating that ability to just even know this is not mine. And instead of necessarily going into service, like before I could really devote or double down on service, 
I actually really needed to double down on self-care because I was naturally inclined to want to go rescue and to make things better for people. Because one of the things about being highly sensitive and empathic is that where, you know, there are all these terms like people pleaser and codependent. What I actually really believe is that the reason that highly sensitive empathic people are so inclined towards service and also towards really rushing into rescue is that we feel better when other people feel better. And so it's like, it's natural that we're going to want to help people because we are like, and we're like a barometer that immediately knows if there is distress. And if we're not comfortable sitting with distress, it can make it very, very hard to not try to fix the problem. The thing is, in my experience, we need to learn how to let it be okay that somebody else is uncomfortable, as well as learning how to let it be okay when we're uncomfortable, when we're going through things. Because in my experience, there's two, at least two pieces to the idea of rescuing. One is that we need consent, that people don't always want to be rescued, that they're going through what they're going through. And it may not be our job to fix the problem. As a matter of fact, a lot of times I think if we just rush into rescue before somebody asks for it, we prolong the inevitable for them and we stop them from, from learning the lesson that they're supposed to be learning. So that idea of it really must be a consensual process before we, you know, rush into rescue. And within that, you know, knowing whether we have consent about it, it's also just really knowing, is this my job? Am I responding to this because of my triggers, because of my stuff, or am I really responding because I am being called to be of service? So for me, before really learning to use the prompt of picking up empathic distress and going, oh, I need to pray for Ukraine. I need to send money to this organization. I need to reach out to this person and find out if I could be of support or help to them. The, the thing that, the thing that I, that I realized was that I first really needed to get out of the sense of urgency, the sense of I need to be a savior, that it's my job to fix this, and instead really learn how to soothe, self, soothe my own nervous system, deal with the triggers that are getting activated by these other people's stuff, and be able to be okay with myself before I was going to start really cultivating acts of service that were coming from a real pure, clean place. Because if I'm not taking care of myself first, if I'm not putting my own oxygen mask on first, there is a quality to the service that I offer that is desperate, that is um, believing that there is a problem instead of coming from a place of grace and ease and trust. And often it just, there's sort of this quality of like the urgency, I think really doesn't help. If anything, I think it actually contributes to the problem. Wow. <laughs> so many good things there. I remember listening to a talk by Esther Hicks um, and she was, somebody was asking, well, somebody was sharing that they were so aggrieved by what was happening. I want to say it was in Africa, a situation going on in Africa, like so aggrieved that they couldn't sleep, that they were depressed, that they were so overwhelmed in a feeling way about what was going on. And Esther said, well, you can never be sick enough to heal another person. You can never be depressed enough to heal someone else's depression. That's not how you do it. You have to rise above into that state of grace and this ease that you're talking about in order to offer them something that they can use to get them out of it. Right? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I don't know where we got this as a species, this bizarre idea that if we jump down into the pit and like start pouring molten, molten lava all over our heads, that somehow that's going to stop somebody else from burning. It's, it's like, no. And, and that's the thing that, you know, empaths, we have a capacity 
to pick up on the distress that is going on in the world. But as much as we have a capacity to pick up on the distress that is going on in the world, we also have a capacity to pick up on the ecstasy and the joy and the love and the delight that is going on in the world. And yet our culture seems to be so focused on this idea of commiseration as opposed to this idea of um, shared delight and shared joy. And yet when it comes to shifting the vibration and the frequency on this planet, it does not come from um, like from empathic overwhelm and just drowning in, in that, like somebody else's distress. Maybe for a moment, they feel validated and acknowledged that somebody else can relate. But in, if anything, they might actually feel less acknowledged and validated because all of a sudden you're not part of the solution you're part of the problem and you're drowning with them and so then you become a problem too and this is something that i've really been think seeing is like as empaths we either as we pick up all the stress and the ener the negative energy that is going on in the world around us we are amplifying it we are reinforcing it we are we are continuing to to um, you know, where we direct our attention and where we direct our mind is what we are reinforcing. And so when we are in that state, we're not doing any good. <laughs> like we're not really helping things. Whereas when we can calm our own nervous system down, when we can let go of our own triggers, our past, the stuff that has been getting in our own way, when we can really surrender that, then what we can do is we can become beacons for calm, love and healing. And recently I, I ran across, you know, happened across a word that, you know, was kind of like, it just sort of jumped out at me. I'm sure I've seen it before, but it just jumped out at me at a whole new level, which is called co-regulation. Co-regulation is that idea that your energy body and my energy body can regulate to each other, that we can vibrate at us, you know, that one of us can strike a chord and the other free person will vibrate at that frequency. And we can co-regulate nervous systems, but as empaths, we can either co-regulate to the distress or we can co-regulate to the ease, the grace, and the flow. I, I want to share um, one thing that recently I ran across that was this meme that, um, that I loved so much that I actually shared on my Facebook page that was talking about the difference between toxic positivity and sort of spiritual bypassing and loving compassion and warmth. And that instead of necessarily when somebody's going through a super hard time, we, it's not our job to like, you know, deny it or be like, Oh, everything's going to be fine. You're going to be all right. As much as it's sort of like, what if we can just offer love and warmth? Like, yeah, this sounds like a really difficult situation. You want to go get some ice cream? You want to, you want to go see a movie? Would you like to just, you know, like hang out in my kitchen while we cook, you know, and cook together that there is that it's like connection is the solution to despair, not toxic positivity. And just like, oh, and some of the platitudes that we were taught to throw out there when somebody's really going through a hard time. That's great. Isn't um, that nice? Um, it's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> I have um, one thing was an observation of mine is uh, that, you know, clairsentience being connected to um, the empathic nature. I also found that folks who are truly empathic and also folks who have brought that nature into a balanced state mm -hmm. also tend to be healers. Like they tend yes. to be the ones that I guess feel feelingly can, can relate on this level. And then that clicks them over into maybe EFT or Reiki, which you also, I believe, do yep. Reiki. Yes. Can you speak a little bit uh, to the empathic healer? So the thing that is so spectacular about a regulated nervous system in an empath is that, or somebody with really clear, good, clairsentient gifts, is that we have the ability to tune in to the people we serve. And so we communicate on a different level than just the way like a muggle person will. And even with podcasting, I'm imagining you've had this experience where like when you're working with another intuitive or somebody comes on the show and they're an empath, there's like, 
you've got this conversation going on on multiple levels, like the heart is connected, the sort of the, the psychic mind is connected, and then the words just kind of reinforce it. Whereas if you've ever had a situation where you just happen to have a guest on the show that's not an empath or a psychic, and you're kind of like, like the rapport is just really, really different. And it's just, it, things don't flow necessarily as easily or as quickly. So I think the thing about being this kind of person is that it allows us to be connected on a number of different levels that sort of the average bear may be able to over time cultivate, but doesn't naturally have that ability or gravitate towards. And so as a sensitive, once we've learned how to do sort of the psychic hygiene and really continue to let things flow through us, as opposed to just absorbing it and trying to transmute it ourselves, what can happen is we can sense how the energy is flowing for somebody and when the issue is getting resolved, when things are being worked with, we can even often sense where exactly in somebody's body or where in time does, does the issue come from? Is this physical? Is this emotional? Is this spiritual? Is this mental? Is this all of the above? Has this been in their body for a really long time? How big does it feel? How congested is it? How much attention does it need? We have this amazing capacity to tune in to the people we serve and get almost immediate feedback. It's kind of like empaths are like naturally are hooked up to the monitors. Like we are, we have by our nature, we have the monitors that allow us to, you know, follow the heartbeat and follow the brain waves and follow the breath and know what's going on. And so we also know as we can recognize when things are shifting and we can also be guided and led to the direction that we want to go in. Now, I'd love to make a comment and say that just because we have these empathic abilities or these and these psychic abilities and maybe really good intuition does not mean that we have to be the like big foo-foo who knows absolutely everything and that it's up to us to magically just do for somebody else. If anything, my experience has been that the most powerful work comes from a dialogue between me and whoever it is that I'm working with or serving and supporting them but getting their feedback, getting their consent when we are. So, you know, when we are doing that work, we also really need to be aware of the fact that it always needs to be consensual, that it always needs to be about and that it's not about us and how amazing we are as a psychic or an intuitive or a healer. It's really about what that person's experience is. And so my experience has been that it is better to offer information and ask if it resonates and to ask and give choices about the directions we're going in than it is to necessarily be like, okay, now we're going to do this because I know it's about this thing for you. And I could be completely right. Like I could be getting information that is completely relevant, but if somebody's not ready to hear it, or if it's not landing for them, it doesn't resonate for them, it doesn't matter how accurate it is. And so that's something that I think is incredibly important as healers is to recognize that our job is not to wow people with our amazing abilities or, you know, our accuracy or just any of that kind of like rock star psychic thing, as much as it is about meeting somebody exactly where they are holding the space for them with what they are going through, how they're going through it, and then really being able to share insight from a place of just total surrender. Like this may or may not serve you. I offer this information to you, take what you like and leave the rest. And I think that that's something that at least for me, that's really a philosophy of what a, what I think a good healer is and does. And the thing is that I believe that a lot of us, there's that gift, the ability that 
I just talked about, but then the other side of it is like, why do so many empaths become healers or what makes empaths healers? And interestingly, I was interviewing a woman the other day who very empathic and ended up working 25 years in an advertising agency and used her empathic abilities in marketing because she knew exactly what people wanted to hear. And she knew exactly how to say it. And she knew exactly how to like massage everything into the form because she had her empathic abilities. So I would say that while a lot of empaths become healers, there are all kinds of other ways like empaths can be amazing teachers they can be amazing leaders they can start they can be um amazing artists they can be amazing they can be amazing advertising executives like there's all kinds of different ways that that ability to tune into other people and recognize what really resonates for them is something that we can use in a number of different areas but I think that those of us who become healers as empaths, at least I can speak for myself and say that the relief that I experienced from various healing modalities, and especially from EFT, was so life-changing that I wanted other people to experience it too. I know what it's like to suffer, and I know what it's like to struggle. And so the ability to offer an alternative was like, what, how can I not, how can I not? So I think that that's the thing that happens for a lot of people is that it feels so good to feel better ourselves. We want other people to feel better too. You know, as we're talking about em empaths and empathic overwhelm, and I just loved how you said that our empathy actually amplifies, right? It can amplify, I would imagine in a good way that helps, but it could also amplify in a not so good way or a way that is actually damaging with everything going on in the planet right now. And it's just not the Ukraine war. There's like inflation, there's politics, there's unrest everywhere. There's, you know, am I going to be able to rent this house or the mortgage rates and all of the things that we're always worrying about? Like I start to really think about how many of us are empaths that are just in perpetual reaction to the prompts that are coming in. I think, I mean, can you speak to whether you think, uh, so for example, I would consider you an activated empath, like you understand mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. empathic nature, mm -hmm. you've been working on that and you're directing it. But I, I wonder if the majority of empaths have no idea. They just think I'm yes. living in a crazy world and a crazy life. Yes, <laughs> Making exactly. it worse as a result. And one of the reasons why I have been getting on podcasts and I've been writing these books and doing everything I'm doing is because I really do believe that there is a large portion of the population that are empaths that don't even know that they are. And one of the reasons for that is that how many times, like I I'm imagining that you, like every other person I've ever talked to has been told at a certain point in your life, probably many, many times you're overreacting. You're taking it too seriously you're taking it too personally, you're too sensitive, stop making such a big deal out of it. And all of these other kinds of like, you are wrong for feeling this way about it. And so what I find is that there are a lot of people, especially sort of the people who are like the kind of the canaries in the coal mine, and also sort of like the designated emoter in a family system, they will often be the one who is processing the feelings that everybody else is trying to deny, but because they are processing feelings that everybody else is trying to deny, they will very frequently experience a great deal of invalidation, a great deal of denial, a great deal of pushback. Mm. And so what I find is that just being able to identify and go, oh, the reason that, you know, like I've my, my, you know, like, oh, my raging alcoholic parents who didn't want to deal with any of their stuff. Um, and this is just an example. I'm very grateful to say that I did not have raging alcoholic parents. I, I mean, did. <laughs> yeah. My parents were both, um, my parents were more in the adult children category. So there was more of that. They came from, they were, they were the generation that said, we're going to, the buck is going to stop here with us. But, you know, when you come from, whether it's actually, and interestingly, when you're sort of 
coming from the even the second generation in and you've got you know adult children of alcoholics raising you there is just this entire system of denial of invalidation of trying to suppress things of trying to stuff things trying to keep it all down and so as a result those of us who are kind of the ones who are feeling all of it will often really think we're come you know come into this sort the story feeling broken questioning everything about ourselves and really trying to control the emotions that we're experiencing. And, um, you know, so that's part of it. The other thing I actually think that's happening is that a lot of people do have a capacity to compartmentalize their emotions in a way that some of us do not. But as the world is heating up, as things keep on getting more and more intense on the sort of earth plane, what I see happening is that more and more people are awakening to their empathic sensitivity and they cannot ignore or deny the intensity of what is going on in the world around us. And I was channeling a whole bunch of material back in July for a book that will come out sometime probably within the next year. And one of the things that my guides, my counsel was explaining was that more and more people are awakening to their empathic sensitivity because when we can feel how out of balance and there was a movie that came out back and I think it was like the late 80s, early 90s called Koyana Scotsi. And the word is, I think, a Native American word for, but don't quote me on that. It might be another culture's word, but Koyana Scotsi means life out of balance. And I really believe that a lot of people are awakening to the sensitivity of the things that exist outside of themselves, but especially are awakening to feeling how Cleonoscotsi we are in that this is like, we all have to get on board with this. We all have to come to a place where we say the buck is stopping here and we are going to make different choices. We are going to do different things. We are going to say no to greed, to patriarchy, to capitalism, to all of the things that feed, that profit off of human misery, profit off of animal mis, like profit off of misery, period. But where we start saying something, it's possible to do something really different. And that's what we choose now. So I do believe that a lot of people are waking up to this. And at first, it really kind of, it's hard. It's not easy when we first wake up to it, because especially if you'd been chugging along kind of with blinders on and managing to kind of go through life, just really sort of in sort of a nice little bubble of self-awareness, maybe with some compassion and sympathy, but not necessarily that empathic overwhelm suddenly to awaken to this can be very disorienting, can be very confusing and can be very distressing. So I totally agree with you that I think that some of what's happened, and then you get all these people who are in this empathic feedback loop where they're picking up the distress from the world around them, and then they're feeling it as if it's their own, and then they're amplifying it. It's like, we've got this like ever increasing feedback, like, you know, like, you know, sort of like microphone and speaker back and forth where it's just like, we've got this, this awful feedback loop of distress that's going on right now. And it all kind of comes back to the mechanics of manifestation. Um, I subscribe to Neville Goddard, and he wrote a book called Feeling is the Secret. And it's your state of feeling about yourself. And it's your state of feeling about the world that creates your experiences and creates in perpetuity the world that you experience tomorrow and it's really getting in check with what you're feeling right now and why and then doing what you can he, he calls it not indulging a lower mood but like getting back into a divine mood just a divine mood of self in order to create something different for your tomorrow not for just you though for everyone and he yeah. would say that everything is just you pushed out which is just a law of correspondence but it really is true that we are collectively creating all of it, you know, and mm -hmm. we're creating mm -hmm. primarily based on how we feel within ourselves and yeah. as ourselves. So it's just a profound lesson, but I have to underscore because I just, if I had a mic, oh, I do, but I can't drop it, but I would, if I could, um, when you point out 
that the empath in the family is doing the emotional labor and processing of the family that's in dysfunction and then is turned around and ostracized for feeling too much or being the black sheep who's so different who doesn't know how to get her feelings under control she's always crying in a corner nobody understands her i think so many spiritual people relate to that but that's because of our natural nature of empathy mm -hmm. and because we're mm -hmm. the one that is in the corner just processing it, moving it around, trying to get it out, but we just don't know how, and we don't even know that it's happening. That's right. so profound to me. Right, right. Well, and so often it will then start to manifest as patterns of distress and dysfunctional behavior on our own part. Maybe it becomes an eating disorder. Maybe it becomes getting into codependent relationship after codependent relationship. Maybe it's a empath narcissist combination. Maybe it's like full blown addiction with drugs and alcohol. But, you know, a lot of because the thing is that like we have to find solutions and 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 i really do believe that we can i either find solutions in a healthy way or kind of the universe will become an agent or you know and, and our own subconscious will sort of find whatever works best and if there are no tools and there's no support for emotional intelligence then a lot of times where that empathic sort of the, the black sheep of the family ends up going is often down a very, very difficult road. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is so great, but I, I kind of do want to take it back to your personal story because I, in reading about you, I know that you call yourself a former hot mess and world-class awfulizer. Yes. <laughs> so I want you to speak about who you were as a person when that was going down and how you became conscious to it and started to change it personally for yourself. So when I was, so, so when I talk about being a hot mess, I really think about like being, I was very high strung. I was very emotional. I was very reactive. I was always looking to, um, something outside of myself to fix the problem. And particularly like romance was kind of my drug was one of my drugs of choice. Um, you know, I had a raging sugar addiction to try to self-soothe with sugar, but I was also just like, just, I didn't know how to sit with myself. I didn't know how to be uncomfortable with myself. I didn't know how to be in solitude. So I experienced a lot of loneliness. And so I was always wanting more from the people around me. I was always wanting like more than they could give me. I was wanting more commitment, but I was simultaneously attracted to people who are emotionally unavailable and not really interested in being in a relationship with me, you know, and it manifested like my distress and me being a hot mess manifested as being very emotionally intense, very emotionally volatile, um, very reactive, taking things very personally all the time, you know, may, forming conclusions about what other people thought of me when really they probably just weren't even thinking about me at all. And as well as like massive issues with like time management, with getting things done, you know, completing projects on time, having the self-confidence and the self-esteem to just even put myself out there into the world, but also things like perfectionism. And interestingly, there's a very strong, there seems to be quite a correlation between some, you know, like a lot of sort of like neurodiversity and um, empaths. And so ADHD and empaths, often there seems to be a correlation where there's a lot of us who also have some, you know, have, have some ADHD tendencies or are just full-blown ADHD. And so as I look at it, it's sort of like, whether it was empathic overwhelm or it was sort of my, my brain wiring, there are a lot of the characteristics that come up or that you can see as sort of the challenges for somebody with ADHD are also challenges that come up for people who are empaths. And, um, and so, you know, that was, hopefully that gives sort of like paints a bit of a picture of like what I was as a hot mess. World-class awfulizer. Awfulizer is a word that sort of, I came up with a while ago to describe, especially my parents and my, you know, like growing up around people who could always like spin forward the worst case scenario until it was like 
awfulized so badly that it's just like, you don't even want to take the risk. You don't even want to take the chance. And I was really used to like my mom worry was the highest virtue that she could have. She, she had like her idea was that to worry was to love somebody that worry was a form of care. And so she would lose, like she would lose an entire night of sleep worrying about her grandsons or worrying about her siblings or worrying about like her children or worrying about the state of affairs, worrying about the world. And her perception of that was that this was like the best thing she could do. She never really got the memo that worry just is basically praying for something you don't want. But the thing about her was that she also had this capacity and she's still, I, I speak in the past tense because my mom is, um, dealing with some pretty extreme dementia. So her cognitive abilities are gone. She's physically in, you know, still on still earth side in her body, but mentally, none of this is relevant for her anymore. And, um, but that she could with any situation, not only was she good at worrying, but she would also push it, push it, push it into awfulizing. So I learned from the best how to awfulize. And I learned how to, take a slightly uncomfortable sensation or feeling and cascade it out until I'm like looking at like the, and you know, like I'm looking at Armageddon. Wow. That's good. That's gotta be a hard place to be in a hard way to live, really. It so, was not fun. <laughs> it doesn't sound fun. Yeah. You know, it was I'm, not fun. I'm thinking about like, you know, your empathic mastery, and I would imagine that for somebody who's, I would say, acutely empathic and it's out of control and you have a, you have some steps to take, but like the first thing you have to do is have some breath and space inside of your being. And it seems like a lot of the empaths that are imbalanced have clinical anxiety, like yes. in my physical body, I cannot even, you know what I mean? Yes. So what is the first thing somebody can do just to get that breath and that space to get to a place where they can even take the first step and start recognizing what is mine, what is yours kind of a thing? So for me, you know, I mean, this is such a, I would say that I think first steps are where what is really wrong? I mean, it's sort of, I think it's very individualized, but what I guess I would say is one of the first steps is looking at what are the places in your own life? What are the things that you may be doing in your own life where you are actually shooting yourself in the foot? Are you drinking? Like, are you, are you self-soothing by, you know, having is like, is it wine o'clock every day? Are you, are you like, you know, are you carrying a sippy cup with wine? I mean, there, I know so many moms, especially where wine has become kind of like this, like reward, but where alcohol, but especially, you know, like just like that evening, you know, like that evening alcohol, that evening wine is sort of like the self-soothing, the self-coping. And I'm saying this not at all from a place of judgment, as much as I'm saying, there are certain things we can do that bring us temporary relief, but the problem is that it brings us, it does not bring us long-term relief. So I guess I would ask, like, are there substances? Like, look, where might you be shooting yourself in the foot? Are you consuming substances that are affecting your ability to, like, it might bring you temporary relief, but then as you start to, as it starts sort of moving through the processing, all of a sudden you feel worse instead of better. You start feeling more anxious. You start feeling more uncomfortable. Could be cigarettes. It could be sugar. It could be shopping. It could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be um, sex. It could be binge watching Netflix. It could be any number of things. But I think looking at that and going, where might I be shooting myself in the foot? As well as where am I telling myself that I am responsible and that I have to do something that I am stuck here? When the truth is, even if it feels like a hard road to hoe, I am choosing to show up. Like there's a really, so I would say one shift that we can start making is even to basically say, I choose to stay here 
with this untenable, you know, with this very challenging situation, like maybe um, caretaking for an aging, you know, aging family member who's very sick. We have a choice. It's just that the consequences of that choice may not be like we we choose the thing that's hard because we do not want the other, you know, the other thing is harder. Um, and I think sometimes that we sort of feel like we're trapped because, because it feels like the alternative is work would, but, but we still like, we are, if we can, if we can embrace the idea that even if something is really hard, we are choosing to do the hard thing as opposed to we are stuck. We are, you know, we have to do the hard thing. We don't have to do the hard thing. Any one of us could say, you know what, this is for the birds. I'm done. And just pick up and say, you're on your own. There are consequences to that. And we might not be able to live with it, but there, but we all get to choose where we show up, what we show up for, whether we continue to show up. So I think starting to shift the perspective so that we recognize, yes, this is hard and I'm still choosing this is a lot more empowering than I'm stuck here. And then another step for me, and this is sort of generally the first step is when I recognize that I am feeling a sense of distress, what I will do is I will just put my hands on my heart and I will simply ask the question, is this mine? And nine times out of 10, the answer is yes and that some of it is mine and some of it is not mine. And then what I like to do from that, once I understand what is mine and what is not mine, is that I look at the places that are my work to do, and I will often use EFT to address and clear it, or sometimes I might use something like a motion code or just some prayer or breath work, but I will sort of set the intention that my part can be healed and addressed and shifted. And I then also say, I send that which does not belong back to where it belongs. I send that which does not serve me back to where it belongs. And just breathing into my core and then breathing out all the stuff that is not serving me. So these are some of the things that we can start to do. But what I want to say is that we did not get this way overnight. And so a lot of times it's a process of learning how to gradually reboot and reset our nervous system, because the problem with anxiety disorders and with very highly sensitive, anxious empaths is that our nervous systems are often so dysregulated, we don't even necessarily know what it feels like to be relaxed and calm. And in the work that I've done with a lot of highly sensitive empathic people who have struggled with anxiety, what I have found is that it's not you go from a, a 10 of anxiety down to a zero. It's that you go from a 10 of anxiety, maybe down to a seven of anxiety. So it's a little bit more manageable. And then from that seven, maybe down to a five, where it starts to feel like you can take a little bit of a breath, like sips of oxygen. And then from that five, maybe down to like a three, where all of a sudden it's like, you start feeling like there's more spaciousness and there's more possibility. And maybe you start seeing like, oh, I could enlist the help of my brother-in-law to fix this situation, or I could actually say no to that person instead of just continuing to engage with this. So we start to create more space for ourselves. And eventually we start to bring ourselves and our nervous system down to what would be you know, a regulated state as opposed to the dysregulated state that so often we are in. And so... Um, you know, one of the most simple ways to restore ourselves or bring us back into sort of a, our body, because a lot of times when we're in that sort of fight, flight, freeze, flop, fawn stage, is that we are, um, that we're not really in our bodies at that point. 
So one of the very first things that we can do is actually, it's a very, very simple thing to get ourselves back online and back in our body, but it involves just a sip of water or a beverage. And so what I, you know, what we can do is just, you know, take the beverage and instead of just sort of gulping it unconsciously, really pay attention to what we're drinking. And so what I'm going to do, I've got a bottle in front of me for anybody who's listening. You've got something in front of you too. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do right now, and if you guys are listeners are here, if you are, have something to drink, what I want you to do is just as you sip or as you take some into your mouth, feel it in your mouth and then follow the sensation of the liquid as far as you possibly can into your body and just notice what it's like to really feel that beverage in your mouth, your throat, and even possibly going down into your stomach. So when you're ready, just take a sip. Wow, so much is available that you don't really ever notice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What I find amazing <clears throat> is that every time I do this, I'm always struck by how much more I feel when I'm tuning into that beverage than I usually am feeling when I'm sipping water. And I can still feel it going into my body right now. I can still taste it in my mouth, but I can feel the liquid like entering into, like I can feel it at my solar plexus now. And there is a way that that really allows us to enter back into our body and just gives us that like, oh, this is where I am. It's kind of like this little exercise is almost like if you were in the, you know, at a shopping mall or any, or a, an amusement park or possibly an airport or any place that has like one of those really big diagrams that has the maps that say you are here the water or the whatever beverage it is that we're drinking allows us to restore or to come back to you are here, you are here. And it helps us to reorient. Where are we? What are we experiencing? What, it, what, and just like, I am here in this body right now. Mm, yeah. So good. And what I love about it is that it's simple. Yeah, it's not an elaborate spiritual discipline to get back. In the, it's just no, take a sip of water and take notice a and sip feel of water yeah. and notice and feel because and the reason that this I suggest this as opposed to like using breath, breath is great. But when we're in a really dysregulated state, it's actually we can sort of find ourselves going further out with breath like we can it can end up almost like we can find ourselves sort of being even more activated if we're already super, super activated. And the wonderful thing about beverage, I mean, taste is probably smell and taste are the very first sensory awarenesses that we have smell, taste, and touch the first awarenesses touch, probably the first feeling our mother's, you know, feeling ourselves against the walls of our mother's uterus at first feeling ourselves coming through the, you know, through the birth canal, like that's our first sensory awarenesses. And then probably like the smell I'm imagining, like the sense in the air would probably be one of the very first things we experience as we come into the world, maybe awareness of light, but our eyes are still closed, but sort of that like sensory awareness of light. And then within the first 24 hours of our life, we latch on and we start, you know, we suckle and we experience, we, we experience nourishment. And so that, you know, those, that, that very, 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 very primitive primal, like just like brand spanking new infant brings us back and talking about certain, you know, sensory awareness, if we think about the kinesthetic side of it, another thing that I really love to do when I'm noticing I'm out of sorts is I really like to tune into gravity. I really love to feel how I am connected and just surrender to gravity. So what I often do is I just start by paying attention to the surfaces that are beneath me. I pay attention to the surfaces that are holding me. And instead of just like 
I don't know, taking it for granted the way one could take a sip of, from a beverage for granted, I really let myself feel the fact that the chair is holding me and is supporting me. And I sink in, I give into gravity. I let the burden down. It's sort of like, instead of trying to hold my weight, I let the earth hold my weight instead. And I let myself be held. And so that's another thing that we can do is just really pay attention to the surfaces that are against our body that are supporting us and holding us and really let gravity give in. So good. Mm. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm in love with everything we've been talking about. I also think it's just so helpful for people who feel a little out of control right now, definitely worried and anxious. These are like actionable things that we yeah. can do to feel better now and start to get conscious to how we're creating out in these streets. Um, you mentioned having clients and as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, this woman's a channel. And then you said you were channeled. Yeah. You're definitely, even as you're just on a podcast, I can see the cadence of your voice. I can see it all happening. You are a masterful teacher. Like you can break down these concepts, which are pretty sophisticated spiritually and make them understandable to the lay person so i understand oh, you mentor you so much. you're welcome i mean it i understand you mentor you have clients you're a healer you do all kinds yeah. of things but if somebody wanted to reach out and start to work with you or maybe take one of your courses i don't know if you offer them but you should if you don't i do <laughs> okay how yes, do they do as that a matter of fact as a matter of fact <clears throat> empathic mastery academy 2.0 is actually just about to start like in the next couple of days. And it is a program that has live rounds that run um, at this point in time, at least once a year, if not more frequently. So people can find, learn more about the work that I do. I will say my landing page is not Marie Forleo quality. It is definitely <laughs> not going to get me on Shark Tank. Okay. It is kind of a, I put all my energy into the teaching, not necessarily into creating a got slick it. landing yep. page. <laughs> so if you go there and you're like, oh my God, that landing page is pathetic. Yes, I totally get it. It's pathetic. And um, empathicmasteryacademy.com is where you can learn about doing work, this work, but you can also buy the book. You know, I've got a Kindle copy for like $9.99 and as of October 1st, which is, um, although I don't know when this is airing, so maybe after that, but every October 1st is the birthday of my book, Empathic Mastery. And I always offer very, very, very special things as well as I've got a Goodreads giveaway that's going to be starting very soon for people to win copies of the book. So, you know, if you pay full price for the Kindle, it's $9.99. The paperback is $17.97. So you can go and buy, and it's 380 pages with a lot of information. Part one is about what does it mean to be an empath? Why are we this way? What's the ramifications of that? Um, what's the impact of it on our planet right now? And why is this so important? And part two is the five-step system of recognize, release, protect, connect, and act. And you can find a copy of that book by visiting empathicmasterybook.com. And then for just how to work with me, connect with me, empathicmastery.com is the best place to go. And the other thing that I do is I do professional level EFT trainings where I teach people how to be impeccable EFT practitioners. And I do a same, I do right now, I run one 11 week program in the springtime for level one and two practitioners. And you can learn more about it at eftinstruction.com. And the reason I only run one is because then I spend the rest of the year mentoring my students into becoming spectacular practitioners and jumping through all the hoops that they need to jump through. So that is, wow. That's how you can reach me. Lots do of I have wonderful. Hmm? Do I have yeah. a moment to say something else? Absolutely. Yes, please. So I keep on noticing behind you, mm -hmm. there is an image of the Blessed Mother. Yes. Yes. And I am also a Marian. I am mm -hmm. a complete devotee to Our Lady in by any name you like to call her. I adore her. And I just keep on thinking about, you know, as your that one of your teachers was talking about, you know, not staying stuck in the lower emotions, but elevating into the divine emotion and that divine connection. And I was thinking about Our Lady of Sorrows in particular, that the aspect of the Blessed Mother, and she could be, you know, Isis, who is 
grieving the loss of her, of, of Osiris. It could be any number of aspects of the divine, but in the myth, within the mythology about when deity, when um, our mother, the blessed mother has gone through something really, really hard. And what I have found is that when I am despairing, when I am going through a really difficult time where I'm losing my perspective, I actually really specifically pray to Our Lady of Sorrows, and I ask her to show me how to endure it. I ask her to help me through it, to get perspective. Because what I have found is that there is a capacity within the divine to hold space for sorrow and within the divine to hold space for all of the human condition with a perspective that only comes from immortality, that our human egos and our physical incarnations that are so terrified of, of leaving these cells, you know, and which is so ironic because I truly believe that what we are as human beings is that we are cells on the body of this planet. And just like cells in our own body die and are reborn and are renewed, we are designed to die and be reborn and renewed. But for some reason, and I think this is the great lie, the great illusion that started getting told with the onset of some of these like newfangled human philosophies that probably started about 5,000 years ago, but that we lost the plot and we lost the perspective of our, of our immortality, of our immortal soul, that we are part of something substantially bigger, that we are just, we ourselves in the body of the earth, that the earth, we are of this earth, we are of the cosmos, that we are of the galaxy, and that there is a perspective that allows us to endure even the hardest things. And so I just kept seeing her over in the corner there mm -hmm. and just thinking like, I really want to make a plug <laughs> specifically for the deities who have endured hardship and who understand hardship and especially personally just tuning into when I need to calling on our lady of sorrows because she knows how to handle this in a way that as the human ego simply does not. So very true. Actually, my uh, mother-in-law gave that to me before she passed. Um, she was a Catholic all her life. I, I've never been Catholic, but I, I just loved how she was a Catholic and I loved her love for Mary. And in my spiritual journey, I started to open up more to the divine feminine and all the different versions and aspects. But not only is there the support there, and, I, and people need to know that, Jennifer, that there is spiritual support and there are also deities uh, that can receive that. And I talk a lot about being willing to put it on the altar or just to mm -hmm. offer it to spirit mm -hmm. because spirit knows what to do with that. Mm -hmm. And spirit has the facility to take it from you. Maybe not all of it, but spirit has the facility to take it from you and to heal it and to purify and to just lift that burden. But we got to ask. We, we got to ask. ask. And, and we also need to let our, we also need to like open our hands up and like stop the death grip. Like, you know, I think of Charlton Heston and my cold dead hands. <laughs> You know, it's like we <laughs> we cannot hold on, like we cannot grip it. And for me, for me, it's also about perspective. I am not the bus driver. The Blessed Mother Divine Source is the bus driver. I am simply one of the chaperones on the back of the bus with a bag, with a, my, 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 my Whole Foods bag bag with a pump orange bag with a pumpkin on it with like a bunch of juice boxes in it and my job is to just like sit down next to the kid who's crying look out the window with them and give them a juice box and encourage them to just like just like settle down and watch the scenery my job is not to steer the bus my job is not to figure out the solutions and when I really got right with God, you know, kind of got right with my perspective of like, what's my job, what's not my job, and realized like, if I'm in the driver's seat, I'm in the wrong place. I am not the driver. I don't know where we are going. And so for me, I follow direction. I listen very carefully to 
where I'm being guided to go and listen to my intuition. And so I'm not talking about being just helpless. Like I'm very active and proactive in things. I'm just, I just have the perspective at this point that my ego it's, it's human ego that got us into the mess we're in. It is not ego, human ego that is going to get us out. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. And it also is a relief to not have to figure out how to do all of the things yourself. I mean, Neville Goddard says that the subconscious, which is the manifesting principle, in a way known only to itself, sets about to create these things for you. Like you don't have to worry about how they're making your burger in the in the kitchen. You don't have to worry about whether it's gonna be juicy and good. You just sit there at the table, you wait, you're in ease. It's a lovely night, you're sitting with your friend, they bring you the burger, you got it. And so there's a big relief to not having to figure it all out for yourself and just leaving it with the divine that can absolutely take it and transmute it as well and turn it into something that works for you. Oh my gosh. Jennifer, I feel like I made a friend today. It's been so I feel like it too. Such a good conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, so good. This has been such an absolute delight. I'm thrilled that you reached out to me. Thank you so much for having me here. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on the podcast. And I would really love to stay in touch if that's okay. Absolutely. Please, please, please. Beautiful. Thank you so much. 